important. So the first thing we're going to go over, like I said, are the guidelines and rubrics. Now you can find this um, in your course, your course section, um, under the, uh, you know, j wherever, just like in every class, there's um, an assignment guidelines and rubric section. So this would be found there. Um, and your instructor might have shared it with you um, additionally in an announcement um, or referred you there. So everybody has access to this and hopefully you, re you have reviewed it for the final project and for the milestone. Um, and Kate's here too. Hi, Kate. So this, uh, for 201 students, um, your milestone one just includes two critical elements of your paper. Your paper will be, uh, if I remember correctly, about 15 critical elements long. So this is just the first two. So it's a nice way to get your feet wet, um, sort of get some research done on your company um, before really getting into the nitty gritty economic stuff that you're going to apply in your analysis of your company. So you'll see that here, the guidelines show you that you just have the introduction section, which has these two critical elements, A and B. So the first one is to outline the purpose of your final project research paper and explain how it will inform your conclusion. Now, this throws some students for a loop. And um, that's because in for a lot of you who have taken English courses with SNU, um, outline might make you think of an outline. So when you write a paper, before you actually write the paper, you might do an outline. But here we're saying outline as a verb. So you're going to outline, basically briefly describe um, the purpose of your final project research paper. So this is more just a very standard approach for writing um, this kind of research paper where the beginning lets the reader know this is what I'm going to be writing about, and this is why you'll want to read it, and this is what you'll take away from at the end. Um, so it's kind of a little preview of what the paper is about. Now, you obviously haven't written the whole paper yet. So this outline at the beginning, it, you know, for most students, it's just about a paragraph long. It might be a little uh, brief, and then you can add to it for the final version of your paper. So this is sort of like... Um, a rough draft of this section of your paper. But we do want it to look and be your best effort and look like a final paper. Um, so it's going to have a title page like your paper will have, and it will have all the headers um, like your paper will have. It will just only include this section. Um, and then you'll add on the sections as you go. So that first paragraph describes or outlines the purpose of your paper, just like any research paper would do. Um, and then the, and, um, John, I see your question, and I will definitely get to that, um, about what it is your paper will do. So that's about a paragraph long. And then the second element here is to summarize the history of your chosen firm and provide an overview of what it does and what goods and services it sells. So um, depending on your company, this might be pretty long if they have a very long history and have changed um, products or services over time as uh, the market has changed. And if you have a younger company, then you might not have quite as much to say, but um, do make sure you, you give a, uh, a detailed history of the company and in terms of what they've, what they've been providing in the marketplace um, in terms of goods or services. And make sure you're, you're very clear about what goods and services they're currently providing. So um, to answer John's question, which is very important <laughs> about what your paper should be about, that's where it's very critical that you check out the entire final project um, guidelines and rubrics, because that's going to outline all the rest of the critical elements, which is basically what your paper is going to be about. So there are four more sections of this paper, and three of them are content sections, and then the last is a conclusion section. So those next sections are going to cover some very broad economic topics. Um, one of them is supply and demand. Um, and obviously that's a you know looking at supply and demand for the good or service that your company sells. So if you pick, you know, um, in the sample paper that we share um, in your resource area of your, your course, it's on Hershey's chocolate. So they sell candy and gum. Um, and so you'll look at supply and demand for those kinds of goods. And then the second section is about price elasticity of demand, which 
you won't know a lot about yet because we haven't covered that. But because it's all listed for you, what you're going to analyze in the, the whole final project guidelines and rubrics, you can just use the language that's in each of those sections um, to say what you're going to do in your paper, that you're going to analyze those things. You're going to analyze supply and demand for whatever it is that your company sells, the price elasticity of demand for whatever it is that your company sells. And then the last one is the overall market. You'll analyze different aspects of the overall market for the good or service that your company sells. Um, and it'll be a really good idea, um, John, and to anyone else who's struggling with um, knowing what their paper will be about, to look at that sample paper, because that sample paper will, will help with that first introduction paragraph. So my advice to anyone who's unsure is to very carefully read through the whole final project guidelines and rubrics. You find it in the same page you'll find this. Um, to check out the sample paper on Hershey, and also to check out, um, which I'll show you in a moment, the um, and look through the entire um, final project um, guide. So hopefully that answers um, your question, John, and um, any other students who probably had similar questions, because that's always a sticking point for some people. Good, I'm glad to hear it. So I will show you um, the, so to go along with the guidelines and rubrics, we've created a, a guide for, for the whole paper, and we've also broken it down to match up with each milestone. And again, this is just something that sort of explains to you in layman's terms, kind of like what I'm doing right now, um, how to address each element of the rubric. Um, so here, again, it's just these two elements that you have to do. Um, your other milestones will be longer. But I'll share that with you now. All right, and I see Ellen and Kate answering lots of questions and giving some clarification, so thank you all so much. Um, yes, you're not going to go into detail in, that, in this first one um, that outline the purpose of your paper. You're just going to say what kinds of things you're going to do. You're not going to get into the analysis. So, you know, I'm writing my paper about Hershey. I might say I'm going to talk about the demand for chocolate in the United States. But I'm not going to talk about what those trends for demand have been um, at all. I'll get into that in the actual section on demand. So actually, you know what, before we go to the, to the guide to walk you through um, how to address each element, I do want to make sure that um, we take a real quick look at how you'll be graded. So you'll notice that there are only three um, proficiency levels here um, for the milestone. So like I said at the beginning, this is sort of treated as a bit of a rough draft. Um, so to get 100% on each of these elements, you only need to be at the proficient level. So you could be, which is on the final, that proficient level becomes B level work. So if you hit this proficient level, um, you could get a perfect score, but your, your instructor might still have some feedback for you on how you can improve um, for your final draft. So don't be surprised if you get a high score, but then you still have some, um, some feedback about things to add. That's to make sure that you bump up to the exemplary level for the final. So this is another reason why I think it's really important to look at the final project guidelines and rubrics alongside with the milestone guidelines and rubrics. So you can see what the difference is in terms of expectations and grading between the two, because a lot of you might be prepared to hit that exemplary level here in your first try. Um, and if you don't, you'll get the feedback to get there. Um, but if you know ahead of time where that sort of end goal is, it might make um, your, your first attempt here on the milestone easier. So I do want to point that out. So, so be sure to take a look at this section right here, um, the, the grading rubric, and compare that to the final project grading rubric for these elements. All right, and now we will go to the guide. Um, now, this guide, like I said, we have this for each milestone, and we have it also put entirely together for the whole final project. Um, bear with me while I pull it up here for you all. And again, this um, most of you will probably just want to read this on your own. Um, a lot of it I've, I've explained already. Um, it's, it's very much what we talk about um, here in the webinar, but there are some um, some links for you. There is an attached. So when you download this, this is in your final project resource folder in the course. Um, 
you'll be able to see some um, the company list in case you haven't chosen your company. Everyone should have done that in week one, but if you haven't, um, the list, the suggested list is here for you to pick from. It gives you some other overviews of um, how to format your paper um, in APA style and just goes over the basics. So while you might not need this as much because uh, for most students, doing the history of the company and the outline um, and the purpose of the paper are fairly straightforward. Um, utilizing this resource, these guides, will be very helpful when you get into the content. So it's a good, good idea to start your very first milestone with the habit of reading through this carefully and um, using this as a jumping off point for your milestone. And then you'll have, if you use this actual document, um, you know, you can, if it's in a Word document, then you're able to just, you know, put your title in and your name and all that stuff and have the, um, a lot of the formatting ready for you. So yes, um, APA is what we use. I know a lot of you are familiar with other styles like MLA. Um, it is used in, I believe, all of the undergraduate business courses, APA. So um, if you are in that, uh, in that discipline at all, then you will be using it again. So it's a good investment. <laughs> so um, Armando asks, um, are you looking for economic history or general history of the company? Um, you know, I, I would say definitely a little bit of both. I mean, we don't need to know who all the, you know, maybe the different presidents of the company were necessarily but major changes they made as a business. So, um, you know, if you have a very mature company like General Motors, that company is gonna have a lot of history. Some of it's gonna be relevant to um, an economic analysis and some of it won't. And, in, you know, just to keep things on the brief side, we don't want your history to be two or three pages long just in and of itself. Um, you might wanna focus on just the products. Um, whereas a company that's younger, you might want to go into a little bit more detail about, um, the general history, um, depending. It, it really, it really depends on, on how much information you need to give to, to give your reader the chance to understand, okay, this is what the company, um, this is how they've grown as a business, um, and this is what they're doing right now. So they kind of get a baseline for understanding the company's, uh, business model and their, ability to make profit and sort of the, the market that they're operating in. Okay, let me, have I missed any questions? Um, but yes, and um, Ellen also, so the history is definitely the history of your company, um, not general history outside of you know, what your company did. So if there was like a recession or something, <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily be talking about that unless you were talking about that in the context of the company doing something specific. So um, a couple questions. Yes, the um, this milestone is due Sunday night um, at end of this module week. So it should be um, when you turn in your paper, not including the title page and the reference page, um, it should be about um, one to two pages. I would say more on the two pages side. Um, usually if you don't spill onto that second page, your history section is too short. So um, the, the purpose is usually a, you know, a third or a half page type paragraph, so it's not terribly long, um, the purpose of your paper. But the history of the company should be um, at least a couple paragraphs. So that should spill you on to at least the second page, just to give you a sort of a benchmark. Yeah. Oh yes, and we turn the clocks back Saturday night. So unless you're a parent and you don't really get an extra hour because your children still wake up at the same time. That's how I feel about daylight savings time. <laughs> I don't really get an extra hour. Um, so that's pretty much it. This is a very, this is your shortest milestone since it's only two elements. You're not really applying any of the economic concepts yet. Um, you're still learning a lot of those. Uh, you know, this week you're just introduced to supply and demand. 
Um, and next week, you'll be introduced to price elasticity of demand. Um, so by your next milestone, you'll be ready to apply both of those concepts. So this one, again, it's going to give you an opportunity to start doing some research. Um, most of what you need for your history of the company can be found from your company's website and from their annual reports. So that's going to be your first stop is go to the company website if you haven't already and get their annual report, the latest one, and maybe some from the past couple of years and start skimming through them. Um, they have some terrific information in there that, where they just talk about their business and about the market. And you're going to learn a lot about your company and what they're doing in their specific market based on that. I mean, they're, the, they're really the experts on, on their business. So definitely read what they have to say. Um, and it's usually very consumable information. Um, if you go to the parts where basically they talk about um, how competition has been in future business, um, it's meant for investors to read. So, you know, people who are just looking to see, is this company going to be profitable? Do I want to buy their stock? Um, we don't look a lot at stock price in this course at all, but we are looking at profitability of a company. So those obviously go hand in hand. If you think that a company is going to be profitable in the future, you would probably want to buy their stock. So even there are sort of two sides of the same coin. So even though you're not an investor, um, you still are concerned with their ability to make profit and how you're going to analyze that from an economic standpoint. So the annual report, even though it's really for stockholders, is going to give you a wealth of information about um, the economics of the company. And for a lot of the com for the suggested companies list, um, I and Ellen and Kate, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we we did at some point have uh, the annual reports up for everybody in the courses for those particular companies, um, just to make life a little easier and faster because uh, we know that everyone's short on time. Um, if they're not in your um, if they're not in your course. Um, the PDFs to download, then again, they're at your company website. Usually it's under the investor page if, um, if you need to download it from the internet. Okay, great. Sounds like they are available. <laughs> awesome. And if you picked a company that is not one of the suggested companies, you still should have no trouble finding your annual report. Um, so, hmm. So Leslie has a question. Will we be using formulas or graphing of supply and demand, et cetera? Um, that's a great question. And we'll talk about more about that at the next webinar, but I'm happy to address that quickly now since we have some time. Um, you're not going to be expected to graph a traditional supply and demand. You know, demand slopes downward, supply slopes upward for your paper. That is uh, more of the theoretical side of economics. Um, which is, is very important, very powerful for you to understand, but you're not going to be able to create your own demand and supply graph um, based on the information you have available to you. Um, so we do not expect that. There are other ways that you are going to be using charts and graphs, um, more in terms of showing company revenue over time or um, sales growth over time, things like that. Yes, the annual reports are very, very long, and a lot of it you can just skip right over. Um, so that's why it's a good idea to get in there now and, and sort of make sense of the information that you're going to need. So a lot of it is about stock price and about how stockholders um, get paid dividends and depending on the company and a lot of stuff like that. You don't need to worry about that. So you can skip over those sections. You really want to get to the sections where they talk about their business um, the competition that's out there, about their future growth. And then um, you will need much later for milestone three, you'll need to look at their, um, their revenue and cost section. So actually your, the revenue section you'll need for the next milestone. Let me repeat that. Um, you'll need that revenue data or sales data, however they've, um, they've termed it, for the next milestone. And then the cost information, their financial data for the third milestone. But if you're sort of just familiar with it just by skimming through it, then when it comes time to actually get the stuff that you need specifically, you'll know exactly where to go. I mean, we do have some videos for those future milestones um, to help you out with that stuff. And your instructor can definitely help you out with it too. 
Yeah. I mean, while it's not something we explicitly teach in this class, um, it's a skill that it's, it's not so hard to get used to looking through an annual report, but it's something you'll be very glad that you know how to do. I remember in my one of my first jobs, that was something I had to do, and I hadn't really done it as an undergraduate student. Um, our, our final projects and our papers and things like this weren't as real-world applicable as, um, as we've tried to design our work here at SNU because we know that you're all, you know, in the real world already working versus um, the typical, you know, just out of high school students who don't sort of have that professional background to, to build on. So we've geared it towards that. And I think it's only for your benefit. So um, it was very difficult to have to learn that on the job. <laughs> I would have much rather had that practice uh, in the classroom before I had to go do it, <laughs> do it for work. So um, definitely something that we are here to assist you with, even though we don't explicitly cover it um, in you know any other assignments other than what you do in your final paper. Um, does cost of sales mean COGS? Yes. So someone answered that. Yep. So some some companies will call, call it cost of sales. Um, I've seen some other weird ones, um, but for most of the part, it's going to say cost of something. So co COGS C O G S stands for cost of goods sold. And that will be something you will you will use very explicitly for um, the cost section in milestone three of your paper. So Jeanette asked um, there. I don't know if I can click on the PDF while I'm presenting, Jeanette. So, um, but I do see the link. So people are asking about Sam Adams and their. Um, their report. So yes, they might say cost of cost of sales. That's the exact same thing as cost of goods sold. Um, so the purpose, Amy asks, so the purpose is what my recommendations are for the company. Um, no, so you're not going to have a recommendation yet. That's that's in your conclusion section. Basically, Amy, what your purpose is that you, you're basically you're saying, here I am, I'm analyzing this company, Sam Adams uh, or Hershey or General Motors, and I'm going to look at um, various microeconomic um, factors such as, and you have this in your final project document, you don't have to memorize it from this webinar, um, supply and demand, price elasticity of demand, and the cost of production and the overall market. And I'm going to use that to, to um, form some recommendations for this company going forward. So you're going to kind of say that you're going to have recommendations, but you're not going to give your recommendations yet necessarily. Now, you can come back and add in some detail about what your recommendations will be at the end, but your instructor is not expecting you to have a recommendation by Sunday because you won't have done all the analysis yet. But if you want to come back and revamp this section for your final draft, that would be terrific, um, and that would definitely, you know, push you into those exemplary categories if, you know, you're adding those kinds of things once you've got all your analysis done. Okay, so John says you're having a hard time. Are you, did you say you're doing Sam Adams? 10K, John, so I see that you asked that. The form 10K. <laughs> yeah, 10, it's, off, it's often called a 10K. That should have all the information you need. So um, I don't know if I've missed any other questions. Let me check the chat quickly so I can address anything before I have to say goodbye to all the 201 students and welcome the 202 students. Can you use verbiage such as I or we? Um, we try to stay away from the I or we, um, but I, I mean, maybe Ellen and Kate, you can you can chime in here on. I'm not strictly against it as an instructor, um, but I, I I tend to see that when students use I or we, that sometimes they take it a little bit too far and start storytelling things from their own life, which we do want to stay away from because it's a research paper. Um, so it's better to err on the side of not using those things because it can be a little bit of a slippery slope, in my opinion. 
Um, and it looks like Ellen is sort of on the same page as me. I don't know how, um, how Kate, how you feel about that. <laughs> um, but I mean, I have, I've had students maybe use I or we, you know, just once or twice, mostly I, um, in their introduction and then never again. And, and usually that's fine um, for me as an instructor. But when you start talking a lot about I throughout the paper, that's when I think it becomes problematic. <laughs> yeah, the annual reports are very long, but again, um, you're only going to need to use certain sections of it. So if you start scrolling through, you'll um, you'll notice what you'll be able to tell which things aren't going to be applicable to you. All the stuff about stock, um, you can skip over. You're just going to go straight to the information about the company's business, um, where they're growing, who, what competition they're facing. Um, and then to their revenue and sales reports, and then their financial data where all the cost stuff comes in. Yeah, I think, Leslie, I mean, in terms of using I or we, I, I would try not to. I would try to avoid it. You can say, instead of saying, I will analyze, you could say, this paper will analyze, or this paper will investigate, um, or this paper will use... So you can sort of do that instead to avoid the I or the we. And hopefully that um, that makes it a little bit easier. And and if you if you uh, check out other types of research papers, you'll see that they take a very similar approach um, to that. They don't you don't see a lot of I's or we's. Right. I mean, even I've read academic papers that are similar in nature to this, but, you know, maybe done by pro professionals, um, not actual student papers. And they'll say the purpose of this paper is blah, 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 very explicitly. So um, the things that you're doing here that we're asking you to do are what the professionals do. So this is um, this is very much uh, mirroring those those habits that we see in academic papers. Yeah, Jeanette, I can't um, click on things while I'm while I'm presenting, so I'm sorry that I can't check it. <laughs> John, yes, and I, I we only have one minute. I'm going to switch to Eco Two Two in a minute, but please don't be overwhelmed by the um, by the annual annual report. You'll find the the smaller area where it talks about their business and their history of the company. A lot of the history of the company is just on the website too. Um, they might even have like just a history tab. So. Just skim it for now, just scroll through it, see what you see, and we'll, we'll provide some more support as we get into the nitty gritty of the paper for the next milestones. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, I don't see any other questions, so um, I'm glad that we had a productive meeting, and um, I'm gonna say goodbye to the 201 students and welcome the 202 students. And with that, I will stop sharing um, Eco 201. And so for 202 students who are on the line um, just joining us, we are going to be going over milestone one, excuse me, which is due at the end of this week, so Sunday night. Um, and this milestone covers um, quite a bit of information that you've been introduced to. So uh, I want to make sure that we've got plenty of time to go over everything. So I'm going to start by sharing I think it might be a little simpler. Well, you know what, I will start by sharing the rubric. So this is where you should always start when you have an assignment so you understand what you need to include and how you'll be graded. So let's pull up that first for our 202 milestone one. So it's the technical name for this, um, this file is Eco 202 milestone one guidelines and rubric. And it's in your rubric folder in your course. And this is what it looks like for, um, oh, let me scroll to the top, for my milestone one. Now, I would recommend that you look at this in conjunction with the final project guidelines and rubric. Um, I th that's important for two reasons. I think it's important to get an overall sense of what your whole project's going to look like. So ideally, you've all skimmed through at the very least, but you've all read the whole final guidelines and rubric um, document to familiarize yourself with the project that's going to make up um, the bulk of your of your work in this class. 
Um, but and then addition to that, to just understanding the whole project, I want you guys to be able to see, um, first of all, which pieces are included in your milestone um, for this one and how you'll be graded here in the milestone, which has sort of a different grading threshold, and then how you'll be graded on these same exact elements for the final. Um, and so that's, again, why it's really important to see them sort of side by side as you go. Um, but we'll focus here just on um, keep, keep the task at hand in front of us, milestone one guidelines and rubrics. So you'll see that um, this is a PowerPoint presentation. Um, you are asked to do, let's, let me add them up. One, one, two, three, four, yes, five critical elements are covered in this milestone. So this is actually um, your longest milestone. The next two milestones are only three critical elements long. And then on your final, there will be four new critical elements to add. So this is, um, in some ways, it's, it's good because you get a lot of the work out of the way. And a lot of this is um, gathering data. So it's not going to be a lot of, um, it shouldn't be a lot of analysis and research on your part as compared to some of the later, later ones. So even though it's more critical elements, a lot of it, a lot of the information you need is much quicker to gather. So we'll talk about that. Um, so the five critical elements that you're going to cover um, all have to do with some of the main pieces of macroeconomic data. So the first two critical elements are related to gross domestic product and growth. So the first one in that section asks you to analyze the annual GDP during the time frame. So you picked a 10-year time frame. Uh, and to calculate specific growth rates and trends in the US economy. So, GDP data, it's very easy to access. Um, and our guide gives you some links to where to access it. But um, you don't have to, you, I highly recommend that you use those links because you'll know that it'll go to reliable data. But you know, if you're more comfortable doing the, the research on your own, then that's fine too. Um, so if you have the, the GDP for each year, you can calculate growth rates for each year. And then some of the, um, the resources that we point you in the direction of can also do that, those calculations for you. So you'll be in some way gathering that information about GDP and making sure you show the growth rates and the trends in that time period for the first critical element. And then the second critical element is asking you to choose two or three of the most relevant historical, or if you're doing a more current event, time period, a current event, um, during that time period and how it impacted the economy. And then the next section uh, here, section B, 1B, is on unemployment and inflation. So those are two more of the kind of main macroeconomic indicators that we look at. So again, the first critical element in this section is asking you to get the data and um, share that in your, in your presentation um, and explain what you see going on there. And then the second one asks you, the second element asks you to apply specific models developed throughout the course to demonstrate how previously selected historical and or current events um, influenced both unemployment and inflation during this time. So this is where um, you will, might not be able to fully address all of these things because we haven't gone through the whole course yet but where you'll be able to get some feedback from your instructor, learn a lot more about, you'll learn more models as we go through the course, and then you'll be able to come back and sort of revamp this um, to meet the final project expectations, um, the final draft expectations. And then the very last one is on interest rate fluctuations. So just like with the others, you got your GDP data um, to get your growth rates, and you got your unemployment and inflation data, and now you're going to get the interest rate data, and you're going to describe um, how that has affected investments and in foreign trade and how that's affected GDP. That will be included here. So it's three different, I'm sorry, four different pieces of data that you're going to be looking at. GDP, unemployment, inflation, and interest rates. So a lot of that um, data is going to be the, the bulk of your slides. And that should be fairly simple for you to put together. Um, and then you'll do a little bit of analysis in the milestone, and then you'll be able to improve on that analysis for the final draft. 
So I am going to, um, now, I don't expect this all to sink in. We definitely want to go through the guide, which is going to help a lot with explaining how to address each of these elements. But I do want, did want you to see them here in the rubric. And then before I go to the guide, um, I did want to show the rubric because this is where um, the sort of the expectations for the milestone are a little bit lower than the expectations for the final. So if you feel like you can't, like some of this stuff, hmm, I don't know how well I'm going to be able to analyze all these things since I haven't finished the course yet. Um, that's to be expected, and that's why we have a slightly lower bar on milestones than we do on the final. Um, so you will be able to show your improvement and understanding and applying this stuff as once you get to week seven. So here, the proficient column gets you 100%. Um, this same level of proficiency will be a B on the final. So there's a way to improve from here to there. Um, so I do want you to sort of, you know, on your own, it will be too long for us to go through it here together um, in the time we have. But to take this rubric and compare it to the final project rubric and to kind of give you a sense of what you'll be expected to do for this week and then how that will be enhanced later on. And that might hopefully um, allay some of your fears if any of you are worried about your ability to apply all of this stuff. Um, definitely much, much easier for this first milestone um, where there's a slightly lower bar than for the final. So um, now that we've shown that, and I do want you to spend some time with this on your own um, once we're done here, if you haven't already, um, I'm going to show you the, the guide itself. So this is built in PowerPoint. And this, I think, is, is really probably going to be the most helpful for you in terms of accessing the data and building your slides. Um, so here we go, um, pulling up the presentation. So this is available to you in your um, final project resources folder. And it is just a PowerPoint. So you can sort of use this as your template. It's very simple, you know, SNHU kind of color and theme template. Um, or you can do something that's a little bit more interesting for you. <laughs> that's up to you. Um, you're not really graded on how flashy or colorful it is. So for most students, they just stick with um, the simple new template. But there is a title slide, which is similar to like what you would have a title paper, a title page if you were writing a paper. And um, there's this sort of preview slide, sort of like an introduction slide, um, that's not perfectly aligned with any one of those critical elements we just went over. But it does give, um, it's designed to help you sort of organize the, the history of the decade, because you are going to have to pull in some of those historical events to um, their economic impact. So this is a way to sort of get that ball rolling. Um, and then on to the actual content slides. So here's where we start addressing those first critical elements. So the GDP, um, it's two critical elements, and it could be one to two slides. Some students are able to address both of those critical elements in one slide. Um, and some like to spread it out into two. So it's, there's no right or wrong answer. It really depends on how you format things. But we do want to see a graph of um, the real GDP growth rates for each year of your decade. So, um, and really for each year, an annual growth rate. So, so I've had some students just share the growth rate for the decade. Um, and that is not what we're looking for. So um, from, you know, the first year might be 3% growth, and the next year 2% growth, and the next year 2.5% growth. We want to see each of those years. Um, so some students show the actual GDP in numbers, you know, it's like trillions of dollars, and then they do the calculation separately to show the growth rates. Um, that's fine too, or you could just show the growth rates. It's, it's really um, has to do with how you want your slide to look. But the, the rubric does require that you give the growth rates. So I just want to make sure that that's super clear because I've had students just show the GDP and not the GDP growth rate, and then they lose points. Um, and then you're going to highlight um, some significant changes you see in the growth rates, such as a dip or negative growth, which is what we call a recession, or a boom, which is often referred to as an economic expansion and more 
um, economic terms. Um, so you'll want to just comment on what you see there. And, you know, you have this, this sort of line that's going up and down. Well, what do these ups and downs mean? You'll explain that. Um, and then we've got links here to um, where the, you can find the GDP data at FRED. Um, and this website is really phenomenal. Um, if this is the kind of thing you're into, um, data and graphs, you can play around with it a lot. If that's not your cup of tea, you can just use it to get the numbers and then do your own thing on your own slide. Um, but you can actually grab their, their graphs and uh, grab them as pictures and put them into your slides. And that is absolutely 100% allowed as long as you make sure you give credit, just like you would give credit to any other information or data that you got. Um, you're going to get the data from somewhere, so you're always going to be citing whatever you get. Um, so whether you're using writing the data down yourself or creating your own graph or using a graph that you find in a website like Fred, um, you're going to be citing it. So this is um, really this this data this database is where you'll find almost all of the data that you need, depending on um, the time period that you picked. So get to know it <laughs> and they have um they have a lot of how-to videos too if you're if you get there and you're unsure so um check out their site through these links um check out some of their how-to videos and definitely if you are struggling at all um hit up your instructor because they can help you out with this too um and then so again this is your this is this link is straight to the gdp data which is in dollars um you want to calculate remember this this to calculate the growth rate so I, I can't make that important enough because i would hate to see someone lose points because they forgot to do it but this um this link brings you to how to calculate the growth rate uh, which you know we cover um i believe this week uh week two in the class so um this link is to your textbook i believe i don't want to click on it now because it might mess up the presentation um, and then the other element here in GDP section is to choose two or three of the most relevant events from this time period um, that impacted the U.S. economy. And then you're going to apply specific models developed throughout the course to demonstrate how these events influenced national output. That's just another way to say GDP during this time period. So one thing that you so a lot of you are probably like, oh, my gosh, I do not what specific models that we've developed throughout the course. We're only in week two, what am I supposed to do? So one model, which is very basic one that you already know is the GDP formula. So this is basically what builds into GDP. So consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So if there was some event that had a big impact on consumption in the country, you would expect to see a change in GDP from that. Or if there was some something major that changed investment or government spending or exports. Anything that happened to impact any of those um, pieces of the GDP formula will obviously have an impact on, on GDP. So this is one model that you are all ready to talk about in week two for this assignment. Now, there are other models that you're going to learn that you might want to bring in later um, to enhance the slide for your final project, but you can absolutely 100% do this right now. Um, so yes, I see some students asking about speaker notes. So this is great. Um, so you've got your, your main stuff here on the slide. So this one, you know, students often break it up into two slides so they can do their show their graph of GDP and GDP growth rates. Um, on one slide and then talk about the historical events in another slide. That's one way to do it. Whichever way you do it, um, your, the big stuff is going to be on the slide. So the graph and the bullet points about the historical events. And then your explanation detail is going to be in the speaker notes. So for example, up here on this first bullet point um, where you show the graph and then you explain the significance of the changes, those dips, those curves in the graph that might come that would come in the speaker notes so you might just have one or two quick bullet points below the graph of the gdp growth rate um, to say you know there was a recession in this year and then talk about it a little bit more how big was the recession how long did it last um, you know things of that nature um, and then the same thing with the historical events if, whether it's on the same slide because you can fit it all in and it or you want to put it on another slide You'll have the 
the main bullet points on the slide itself, and then you'll go into more detail in the speaker notes area. And Kiara, thank you so much for addressing the um, exemplar. So we do have a, a previous example shared in the course. And um, that student's speaker notes were very, very long. Um, she did a great job. Um, you can do a great job and be more concise. So don't necessarily think that you have to reach that level. The, the one really great thing about how this course has been designed is that you have the chance to submit your milestones and get feedback. So if your speaker notes aren't, aren't getting the job done, they are not detailed enough to hit all the rubric elements the way that they're supposed to be hit, your instructor is going to give you feedback on that. So do the best you can. Um, don't think that you have to write a novel. So usually, in most cases, a paragraph, or if it's a more detailed one, two paragraphs is enough. Um, so, you know, that could just be a few sentences, um, you know, in each paragraph, depending on how much stuff you have to talk about. Um, and if your instructor wants to see more, um, they'll let you know in the feedback. And then you'll have a whole other turn to submit this work on the final project. So all this stuff is going to get hit again. And then you'll get to know sort of what, what is enough and what your instructor is looking for as you go on. So probably by milestone two and milestone three, you'll have a much better sense of, OK, this is, this is enough for my speaker notes to address the rubric elements. All right, so that's GDP. We will move on to the next um, critical elements, which have to do with unemployment and inflation. So this one is one to two slides, almost always two slides. Um, my recommendation where I've seen students be uh, successful is to separate unemployment and inflation. So one slide for unemployment, one slide for inflation. And the unemployment slide will show the data. So again, you're going to most likely have a graph. Some students use a table. Um, but you're going to have that data shared here um, on your slide. And then you're going to talk about how it's um, been affected by events in the economy. Um, of your decade. So I think it's easier to separate it out by unemployment and inflation. Um, some students have the data together. They've got their chart for unemployment data and they've got their chart for inflation data on one slide. And then the next slide, they talk about how the events um, were, in, you know, played a role in the unemployment and inflation numbers. So it's really up to you. Um, I think it's easier to have it separated, but you'll find what works for you and, and what makes the most sense for your decade. Um, some decades, unemployment is a much bigger story than inflation, and some decades, it's the other way around, and some decades, it's maybe more of a mix. So you might find that combining them, um, the data, and then doing the analysis of the events makes more sense because maybe there's not as much to say about one or the other. Um, so you'll find what works best for you. Now. We've got the links here, just like we did for GDP. So the link to inflation rates and the link to unemployment rates. Um, one thing to note that is, again, like I told you about the rubrics, the expectation for, um, for the milestone is slightly lower than for the final project rubric. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't try and aim for what's expected in the final project. Um, for example, on this one, um, to get exemplary on this first element, um, analyze unemployment and inflation data, all you need to do to get from proficient to exemplary for the final is talk about how unemployment and inflation rates um, are calculated. You know, what goes into those numbers? How do we determine what they are? Um, what, you know, what inflation rate are you using? We're learning about that this week. And, you know, there's different, um, there's different indicators for that. So, you know, which one are, are you following? Um, Who's included in unemployment? How do they figure that out? So giving a quick overview of um, how the data that you're showing gets calculated um, is enough to get you to exemplary. And you're all in a position to do that right now because we're covering all that in week two. So that's another good reason um, to look at the final project because you might be able to do a lot of that stuff and just get it out of the way and, and be ready and not have to come back and make edits for your final draft. Um, and again, we have this here in the bullet points. So if you're following along with the template, you'll hit a lot of that stuff. But if you're just looking at the rubric elements, you could potentially miss it. 
So um, again, really important to read through everything um, just to familiarize yourself with the work that you're going to be doing. And then just like before, apply specific models developed throughout the course to demonstrate um, how the events um, influenced unemployment and inflation. So this one is the one where you will, might want to come back and add some of those models that we haven't learned yet to your final draft. So if you feel like this part, this second criti critical element in this section is going to be a little bit skimpy, um, don't worry. That's, that is somewhat expected. Um, one of the models that we'll learn in a couple weeks is the ADAS model. And that um, is really going to help you understand the relationship between events and the economy and unemployment and inflation. So you'll be able to beef up this section for your final project. Um, so don't worry about not knowing this now. That's why we have those two different um, grading rubrics. All right, we're going to move on to the next slide, um, which goes over the fifth uh, critical element that you're asked to cover, and it's on interest rates. So um, now the rubric does not specify which interest rate you need to use. Um, the federal funds rate is the most basic interest rate. Um, that's the, the rate that the Federal Reserve lends out money. So it's sort of like the lowest base rate. Um, so that's usually what students use. It's the first one we have listed here. But you could choose some others. Um, you might want to share more than one. But generally, the federal funds rate is where is, is your benchmark. Um, so I would recommend using that one. Um, and then, you know, if there's something specific that you want to talk about that was important in your decade, like home mortgages, you could you could show an additional slide having to do with that, um, you know, if, if that's very compelling. But the very base level one is this federal funds rate. We've got the link to it here. And then a couple other um, pretty basic rates um, that are just always a little bit higher than the federal funds rate. And then you're going to, so you're going to share this graph. Again, usually it's a graph. You can grab the graph from this link, just like with the other ones. Um, if that's not your cup of tea, if you're not really into you know, using the graphing website as much as um, some other students might be. You could just get the data and put it in your own table to include in your um, in your slide. And then you're going to discuss the following. So most of this part, the discussion is going to be in your notes. You might want to bullet point some of the some of the highlights and then go into the detail in your speaker notes. But these are the things we want you to look at. So how would these fluctuations um, be affected by inflation? How would investments in foreign trade rates increase or decrease? How would the GDP of the American economy be affected? And um, this is a link to help you answer some of those questions. So this is jumping us ahead a little bit, again, because, um, because all of this is really part of your final project. Some of this jumps around a little bit. So we lower the bar a little bit on the expectations, um, give you the chance to get some feedback. We do include some of these resources to brush you up on, on how to understand and apply this stuff. Uh, and that should be enough to get you to a proficient level here for the milestone. And then take the feedback, take the new knowledge that you get over the next uh, five weeks, and make any improvements that you need to the slide um, for the final. But that that is pretty much it. Um, hopefully these links to the data and these links to um, some videos and other resources in the course um, you find really helpful. And then obviously the exemplar um, will be a help too and just in terms of understanding, okay, this is what this is what a slide looks like. Um, this is the kind of stuff I should talk about in my speaker's notes. Um, and again, that was the final project. So that you know we don't unfortunately, we don't have examples of, just milestones that might have been good, but then needed some improvement that a student did for the final. We just have an example of a, a final project, which obviously had incorporated a lot of instructor feedback into it already. So do keep that in mind as you're working, that you are working on your first draft and the exemplar that you're looking at is a final draft. Yes. So. Um, yeah, this is the template. Um, this is the temp. So the milestones are just pieces of the overall final project. So your overall final project is going to be about 
you know, in the ballpark of about 20 slides long. This one is probably going to be between, you know, at a very minimum five slides um, plus, you know, not including the title slide and the introduction slide um, and your citation slide. So it'll be five, at least five content slides, probably closer to seven. Um, uh, no, maybe about, no, maybe about five. Um, so about five slides, and then you've got a few more coming up in each of the next milestones. And then there's a couple, there's a few additional ones for the final. So you'll put them all together and that will be your final project. So this is just basically a chunk of the final project that you're working on right now. Um, you won't resubmit this after this week. You won't resubmit this on its own. The next time you resubmit it, it will be part of the entire final project. But the, but the elements that you're addressing are the same. Hope that that makes sense. Um, so you've got three milestones that you're gonna submit and get feedback on. And then for the final project, you put everything together, a couple new things to add, and you're gonna submit one cohesive presentation um, as your final project in week seven. So this is about, you know, about five of those slides out of the total that will be between 15 and 20. And then last but not least, I don't want anyone to forget a reference slide. So um, your references themselves are going to be an APA style. Um, there's no specific APA style for PowerPoint presentations, like you know, running heads and things like that, like we have with papers. But we should see that the citations, in-text citations, are required, and reference list um, is required, both in APA citations. Uh, I'm sorry, both in APA style. So um, you'll set those up to look the same way they would look in a paper. Um, they're gonna you know, be in alphabetical order. This can just be a running list. Um, you just update it as you keep you know, going through your milestones. Um, yes, we are recording this talk and it will be sometime tomorrow um, shared out to all of the sections. Um, I believe it's just a, a simple web link that you'll be able to access this recording through. Um, so this is this slide will not need speaker notes, <laughs> but all of your content slides will need speaker notes. So I, I do want to repeat that um, for those of you who just joined. Uh, I know we had a couple of people join late. Um, the the exemplar, while it does have very long and detailed speaker notes, is does give you a good sense of what kind of stuff is covered in speaker notes. So do give that a look over um, if you haven't already. Um, and this, this guide is really going to detail all the things you need to cover. So this is all, all this, this guide does, and this is the guide for Milestone 1. We've got guides for all of them, and we have a guide that has everything put together, too. The, the guide here, these bullet points on, on each of these slides, tells you everything you need to cover. That stuff is going to be broken up into stuff that's on the slide and stuff that's in the speaker notes. So if you cover everything, um, where you cover it on the slide or in the speaker notes is a matter of style. Now, we do want you to have nice looking presentations um, because out in the world, in the business world, people are using PowerPoint still all the time. <laughs> I use it all the time at work for stuff that's not in the classroom. Uh, my other jobs as a consultant and um, working in nonprofit, I've had to do countless PowerPoint presentations. Um, so this is still very much a relevant skill that we want um, everyone to have practice with, which is why, um, why we've included this in our courses. Um, and while you wouldn't typically at your work use speaker notes, um, you would be saying that stuff. So you wouldn't put everything you want to say on a slide. Um, you would put the basics on the slide, the graphics, and some, some key highlights on the slide, and then you would say the rest. So all the detailed stuff is what you would say. So the speaker notes is kind of a proxy for that. Since we're not in a face-to-face -face classroom, you're not going to get up in front of everybody and present this. Um, you're going to write the speaker notes instead. So that's the trade-off. Um, I think we've covered everything, and it's 9.31, so we're just one minute over. Um, did I miss any questions in the chat? Um, 
Is the reference page included in the total number of slides needed? Uh, Adrian asks. Adrian, there's no specific total number of slides. Um, I was more giving a ballpark. That's the ballpark that I was giving you is based on how many slides you'll need to cover all the critical elements. Um, so if you cover all the critical elements, um, you'll probably have about 15 to 20 content slides. Um, so that's not counting the title slide, um, the, the sort of intro slide on the overview of the 10 year period, and then your reference slides. So yeah, in the end, it's gonna be about 15 to 20 slides of content. Um, and this milestone will be about, um, about five slides. of content. So there's going to be, you know, once you add in all the other slides, I guess there's about three additional. So for most students, this um, this is going to be a total of about eight slides. Um, the title, the intro, five content, and then the reference. All right, I think that was the last question. So I will, um, where would I find it? Oh, that's so, it, the, the email recording will, I'm sorry, the Recording link will be emailed out to all the instructors and they'll be able to share that in your sections. Um, so keep an eye out for that sometime tomorrow. And uh, if no one has any other questions, um, have a great night. Best of luck. If you run into any problems with any of the links that are built in here um, to the data, to the databases or to um, the videos in, in your MyLab textbook that are linked here in a couple places, please let your instructor know and they will troubleshoot that with you. Um, all the instructors are very familiar with the, um, the economic databases that you're going to need and of course with um, the resources in the textbook. So um, Tom asks where he can find the um, this milestone template. It should be in the um, the final project resource folder in your class. So um, if you are having trouble finding that, um, email your instructor uh, right now. It's in, the, it's in the same spot in all the courses because it's, it's built in. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely in all the courses. <laughs> it's built into the master section. So um, thank you, Kiara. Yeah, I don't have this the, the shell myself. Um, because I'm, I'm not teaching 202 this term, but so I don't know exactly what it looks like. So I don't want to lead you astray with misinformation. Um, but it's definitely in there. If anybody has trouble finding it, um, send your instructor an email as soon as you can. Um, or even actually better yet, post in your general discussion forum. Um, because if you have the question, chances are other students in the class have the question. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone so much for your time tonight. Um, best of luck and do not hesitate to ask for help if you find you need it.